This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE Structural Exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE Structural Exam the first time. PPI's PE Structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE Structural books. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at PPI, the number two, pass.com to see all of the resources available for PE structural exam prep. Again, that's PPI, the number two, P-A-S-S dot com. Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we are talking to Christopher Gill, a senior product manager at Hilti Inc. about fastening and corrosive environments and how structural engineers can help to decrease the corrosion of metals used in construction. I'm your co-host, Matt Cardle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Chris. Chris, first, welcome to the show. In your own words, can you please tell our listeners a little bit about what you do at Hilti? Yeah, thanks, Kara, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. What my responsibility is, I have a small team here at Hilti, and what we do is basically a product testing and uh, various tests and analyses that we need to do in order to get approval for our products. And when I say approval, I'm talking about things like either UL approvals, FM listings, and also um, ICC uh, evaluation reports, which is a which is a big thing that we do. Uh, in addition to that, we also take the data that we have, the test data that we have to publish our, all our technical manuals and, and technical guides. And we also back up uh, some of the other Hilti folks in order to answer some uh, technical questions that come in. So we kind of serve as a, let's say a high level technical support uh, specifically for the products that we, that we cover. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I, we wanted to talk to you about the, one of the articles that you wrote in Structure Magazine called uh, Fastening to Steel in Corrosive Environments that talks about technologies that have been developed to address you know, the many causes of corrosion of metals used in construction. Uh, what are some of the factors that need to be considered when choosing a fastener in corrosive environments? Yeah, thanks. Uh, great, great question. And uh, I enjoyed writing that, that article. I think a lot of people understand that that you need to choose a fastener that's going to be suitable for the conditions that you're that you're fastening in. Uh, but I think a lot of times there's kind of different elements of that that you have to consider. You know, a lot of people understand that the the fastener itself may need to be uh, made out of some kind of a stainless steel material, but you also have to look at the impacts of the fastener on the material that you're fastening into because a lot of times you know, the fastener itself may not corrode, but it might, uh, through galvanic corrosion, it might, uh, it might induce some kind of corrosion to the, actual, to the actual base material that you're fastening into. And then another thing that needs to be considered is that a lot of times if you're fastening, let's say into steel, uh, for instance, if you're fastening carbon steel and you're in a, in a corrosive environment, uh, that steel is likely to be coated. It's either gonna be painted, it's gonna be uh, maybe uh, hot dip galvanized, and the actual process of making the fastening uh, can sometimes cause uh, some some interruption in that in that uh, coating or the the protection that's already on the existing steel. So um, the type of fastener that is used and kind of how that gets installed and onto the steel uh, should also be considered. So there's really kind of three considerations. One is the uh, corrosion resistance of the fastener itself. And again, a lot of times you might be uh, choosing a stainless steel in order to prevent that. And also any kind of a galvanic reaction that might happen with the steel that you're fastening into. And then finally, 
uh, any kind of damage that you might be presenting to the to the base material uh, when you when you actually make the fastening. Yeah, I think that's actually really interesting. It wasn't um, I hadn't really thought too much about how certain metals actually attack each other when water is present until I moved to Houston, worked as a field engineer there. Um, I know that there have been technologies that have been kind of brought up to help mitigate these factors. Can you provide us like an example of one of these technologies that can help uh, the corrosion of metals in construction? Yeah, for sure, Kara. There is a, a, a fastener type that's out there now that's called uh, a blunt tip fastener. And the, the reason that the fastener has a blunt tip is because um, then getting to the third point that I talked about before, uh, you don't want to necessarily penetrate through the backside of the steel that you're fastening into. So let's say for instance, if you screw into a coated steel, a lot of times by the act of doing that, what you're gonna do is you're gonna actually damage the backside of the steel. And a lot of people don't think about that, but if you kind of look carefully, if you walk around and look on a project, a lot of times you can see that either a screw or maybe a power actuated fastener, like the ones that Hilti supplies, um, they, the, the act of fastening will actually kind of knock a piece of that, um, that coating off the backside of the steel. And then you, you uh, create a place where corrosion can start. So this blunt tip fastener is actually, a, uh, there's actually kind of two different versions that I'm aware of. One is a power actuated fastener and one is more of a screw in type fastener. And when I say blunt tip, it means that it doesn't have a long sharp tip that will penetrate through the backside. It actually only goes part way into the base steel. So let's say if you have, I don't know, three eighths inch steel, it might only penetrate a quarter inch into the steel, and then it prevents that um, backside damage from happening to the, to the, let's say the flange of the, of the steel beam that you're shooting into. Uh, another thing that this particular type of fastener does is it also, uh, during the installation process, it actually um, scrapes off the coating immediately around the fastening area, um, and it leaves it the steel bare, which sounds contradictory to what I was talking about before, but the reason that it does that is because the fastener itself also has an integrated washer, and that washer has kind of a rubber gasket on it that seals against that area that's been, that's been let's call it cleaned to prevent any kind of corrosion, local corrosion from happening right in the area of the fastening. So this is a type of fastener that's kind of, kind of new and it's uh, maybe not that well known in the market, um, it's, it's kind of kind of specialized for uh, corrosive environments. And uh, the other thing I didn't mention about the fastener, of course, the fastener itself is also highly corrosion resistant in being a stainless steel fastener. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So if I'm understanding that correctly, like one of the common mistakes is, let's say you're in a corrosive environment and then you specify a powder actuated fastener. Uh, you think that it's okay, but uh, if you say you're, you're uh, attaching to a steel beam with that powder actuated fastener, it's basically going to uh, make a weak point in terms of corrosion because it, it chips off that protective layer from that steel beam. And then, you know, when rust gets in there and corrosion, it'll, that's basically going to be your weak point, but it seems uh, like there are fasteners out there that prevent that, but the engineer needs to know about it. Right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and you really need to c consider, you know, really what the environment you're working in is. If it's, if it's an environment where it's only mildly corrosive, then it might not be that much of a concern, or maybe you might want to go with a stainless steel fastener, but maybe not one of these blunt tip fasteners that, um, you know, has all these different features that we talked about. Uh, but uh, just keep in mind that with a stainless fastener, um, if you do get some galvanic corrosion, it's a little bit of a function of, of sort of uh, how, how thick the base material is you're shooting into. But if you do get kind of a galvanic cell setup, then the this, this stainless steel fastener itself might survive for a long, long time, but you'll get corrosion in the immediate area of the carbon steel that you're fastening into over time. And then, and then the fastener could, could come loose. Yeah. Uh, so that's why some of these um, uh, new technologies have been invented. 
And uh, most of our listeners that are seasoned uh, structural engineers uh, have a general understanding of, of corrosion and, and whatnot. Uh, but for our, I guess, our, maybe the younger listeners, the students, could you explain exactly why understanding corrosion is, is so important? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, I, I sort of uh, have, have the hat on of, of uh, connections because, you know, that's what I deal with and I've dealt with for my kind of whole professional career is, is connections. And, um, you know, if, if, if there's going to be any place that's going to be an issue in terms of corrosion, it's going to be at the, at the connection point, whether it's the kind of fastenings that we're talking about, you know, fastening some kind of a material to steel, or even in some cases, um, making a connection between steel and concrete. Um, usually the place that's going to give you the, the trouble is, is the connection. And uh, sometimes it's also not going to be so apparent um, over time that, that that connection is starting to have problems. But obviously, uh, from a structural point of view, the last thing you want to do is, you want, is to see a, a connection fail. Um, if, the, you know, if the steel itself is corroding uh, more um, away from the connection point, it's going to be pretty obvious. But a lot of times, the corrosion that happens around a connection point is going to be less obvious. It's going to be maybe smaller, but it's also going to be more critical because you, you sure don't want that connection to fail over time. Yeah, and I guess you could even say that in the connection points, a lot of fasteners even have a small washer and they don't, it's harder to pick up like at the actual installation po point where let's say the hole is drilled, you know, that washer, there will be a slight gap unless it has that neoprene washer to help um, keep it watertight, can sometimes hide the corrosion over a long period of time. And that can be really detrimental to the fastening or the connection point. Um, Absolutely. So, and we talked a little bit about, you know, metal to metal connections, um, you know, what, so what about materials touching the fastener? You know, how will this affect uh, corrosion resistance? Because you know, when I was working in Houston, I remember talking um, with someone about, it was like a ladder in Galveston. And if anyone doesn't know where Galveston is, look, at, look it up on the map. It's like this little strip of island towards the very bottom of Houston, Texas. And it is like direct salt spray. Like that's all that they get. Your hair gets like super wavy anytime you're out there because that's, that's it's like full on hurricane season, like on the beach, live in life type of situation. But I remember that was one of the, the issues that they had or the concerns that they had was just like an aluminum ladder with carbon steel. And right. there was a conversation about that. So my question to you is, you know, what about the materials touching the fastener? You know, does this affect corrosion resistance at all? Yeah, absolutely. For sure. That's, that's kind of what we were talking about before with, uh, with the galvanic series and, um, you probably even even those who haven't been working in the field that long, probably back in school, you were exposed to the to the to the galvanic series, and um, if you have um, um, the presence of of moisture and actually when there's salt salt involved, it makes it even more critical. And you have materials that are that are separated on some, what some people call the galvanic series. In other words, they're, they're they have a high um, between the two of them, they, ha they have a high um, electric potential, then um, depending on which material is sacrificial and which, uh, which isn't, they're going to uh, cause a corrosion of the, of the sacrificial material. So, so like I was mentioned before, it might actually not be the fastener itself. It might also be, it might be the, the material that's touching the fastener that, that ends up corrod corroding. And I think, you know, you probably, especially working down there, you would probably see it a lot. You'd see an, uh, one material that looks completely pristine and then whatever is touching it is just completely destroyed. And that <laughs> a lot of times is going to be something like aluminum touching carbon steel or carbon steel touching stainless steel. Um, it's actually pretty amazing how, um, how aggressive that can be if the two materials are exposed to salt, water, and if they're um, far apart on the on the galvanic series. And so just to, just to ask you this, cause I don't think I've ever had the conversation with you about it. So 
what are like the worst metals to pair? Cause when I worked in Houston, I mean, obviously it was like always stainless steel and, or aluminum for exterior conditions, but I knew that carbon steel and aluminum were two metals that you had to have some sort of washer or some sort of plastic between the two. Yeah. Could you, could you, do you yeah, have an idea? Um, that's, that's, uh, I mean, without starting to talk about, you know, exotic type materials on <laughs> one end or the other, but just in terms of normal materials, that's, that's definitely one of the worst is, is aluminum to carbon steel or even stainless steel to carbon, um, depending on what kind of stainless steel it is, that, that can be bad, bad as well. Um, mm -hmm. so those are some of the combinations that you should, that you should watch out for and kind of getting back to that, 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 you know, faster in design that we talked about before. Um, you know, it's, it's a stainless steel fastener. It can be installed into, um, into carbon steel base material. But as we talked about, there's several features of the fastener that kind of mitigate that problem because it does have that sealing washer to prevent the water from getting into that connection. And also, like we talked about before, it, it kind of mitigates the problem with damaging the backside of the steel where you might also get some, some corrosion occurring. Thanks, Chris. I've had my last, uh, I, I guess my last two questions are, are I'm going to combine them. I think they're kind of similar. Uh, what were some of the most common mistakes that you see engineers do in terms of corrosion and fastening? And how can engineers uh, decrease the overall corrosion of metals while on the job? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those are, those questions kind of go together. Um, so I would say, uh, it, again, it's a situation where um, I think engineers will say, well, hey, if, as long as I specify a stainless steel fastener, then I'm, I must be covered. And that um, is not necessarily the case. Uh, I, it's obviously a good idea if there's a concern with corrosion. But, you know, first of all, there's different grades of stainless steel. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the kind of the 300 series of, of um, stainless, which is fairly corrosion resistant. There's also a 400 series stainless, which really isn't uh, nearly to the same level as the 300 series. Uh, but even that aside, if they specify um, a certain grade of stainless steel and then don't pay, really pay attention to what the surroundings are, or what it's being connected to, then again, maybe the stainless steel fastener itself will, um, will survive fine, but it'll cause problems in the, in the surrounding uh, connection. So that's probably the biggest thing to watch out for in terms of uh, calling out for corrosion resistant fastening. Yeah, it seems like, uh, like you said, probably the most common thing is, yeah, it's resistant. So let's, let's stainless steel it. It's, it's good. But yeah. then yes, uh, I think less attention goes into what you're actually attaching to. It seems like, especially for carbon steel, uh, which is most wide flanges or typical beams, that's where you'll probably start running into the trouble because water can seep in there and that's where the weakest part is. Absolutely. For sure. And I think it can even be detrimental. I know we, me and Matt have had conversations about you know, right now we're seeing a lot of issues with supply chain management, which means there's a lot of switches happening on the job. And sometimes I think material, I, I hate to say like material is not checked, but like, if you think of, let's say an architect switching out, like maybe a light, a ladder or something for a safety related application towards the tail end of a job because the original spec was not available. I mean, that can even be detrimental if it was a carbon steel anchor or fastener and it's an aluminum ladder now, you know, that could be really impactful for that particular safety related situation. So yeah, I think uh, it's interesting. It's interesting to think that, you know, you also have to have, is it, is it metallurgy, a metallurgical, <laughs> I don't know if I'm saying that right word, the study of metals, <laughs> Metallurgy. you have to have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to have a little bit of knowledge around that, especially when choosing, um, the materials used, especially in corrosive environments. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to that point too, um, 
you, you mentioned about you know, switching out, and I, I was talking before about the difference between 400 series and, and 300 series stainless. And, and, you know, they both have stainless after their name, which, by the way, is another interesting thing, because a lot of people, if they call out for stainless steel, they really expect it to, to, to remain like shiny and pristine. And that actually doesn't happen. Like the way stainless works is it forms a passivation layer. And you'll see that passivation layer and, and it will look like, you know, maybe it's starting to corrode, but it's actually doing what it's supposed to do by forming the passivation layer. And then if you um, call out for, or if you call for stainless and you end up getting a 400 series stainless, the 400 series, series stainless will, will actually exhibit some red rust, um, even though it's quote unquote stainless steel. And so in terms of switching out, if somebody, if you've called out for a 300 series and somebody says, well, I can only get my hands on 400 series. You got to be real careful about that because there's a big difference. That's actually great. I, can you say that word one more time? You said passivity? Passive, passivation. Passivation. I yeah. have never heard that before. Have you, Matt? I haven't, but the, the rusting, I didn't know about that. Like stainless steel is supposed to rust. That means it's working. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, like a 300 series, the passivation letter, layer won't look like rust so much. It won't be red at all. It'll be kind of a, um, a, a white chalky look to it, maybe I would call it. Um, but then again, as I mentioned, the 400 series will, will rust, but that's not, that's not it's doing its job. It's just that it's an a inferior grade of steel that you're working with. And so it will actually not as bad as carbon steel, but it will rust over time. That's really interesting. And this actually leads me into another question because I know, and this is a little, um, maybe a little bit different. So I'm familiar with stainless steel 316, but there's also a 304. And yeah. I asked you a little bit earlier about, you know, some metals do not necessarily mix well, but a lot of, you know, there's, there's two kind of two ways to look at it. Some people still look, oh, they're still both a 300 series stainless steel. Are there any issues with mixing 316 and 304? No, no, they, 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 if they're touching each other, they would be fine. I don't really know why you would do it unless like you mentioned, you know, three, supply 316 chain issue. Yeah. supply <laughs> chain issue. Because 316 is um, under certain conditions is more resistant than 304. Um, there's this kind of special reasons to use 316, but um, it's also a lot more expensive than 304. So if you can, if you don't need 316, then there would be no reason to use it except for, like you mentioned, the supply chain type issue. No, and that's great. I mean, we have a lot of structural engineers who listen to our channel who, I mean, obviously costs right now are super high. We, we've had conversations across the board with different people and, you know, managing or value engineering certain things, you know, is, is becoming a high priority to manage costs on a project. So that's great information for our engineers that 304 does the job um, for corrosion resistance. Yeah. yeah. In most cases. Yeah. <laughs> So Chris, to end off here, um, you know, are there any resources available that can help engineers understand more about the corrosion of metals without getting a metallurgical degree? <laughs> oh boy. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, we have, we have a certain treatment of, of corrosion in, in our technical manuals um, with, with LT. We actually have a corrosion handbook uh, that we just recently published that uh, that you can find on Ilti's website that uh, goes to quite into a lot of detail. It's obviously kind of centered around fastening because that's, that's what we do. So it doesn't talk about maybe other aspects, but in terms of uh, different things to consider with, uh, with corrosion, um, there, our corrosion handbook is a good resource. Uh, but on top of that, there's obviously just lots of different resources that you can find out there. Um, I think those of you who have been you know, trying to find stuff online. It's so like anything else you need to be a little careful because you, you might find some information out there that's not entirely credible. So kind of look at the, look at the source if you find something on, on Google, for example. Uh, but those are a couple of the, the resources that you might be able to find. And you said that was on, is that on Hilti online? So Hilti.com backslash corrosion. Um... That's a good question. 
Um, I think I think if you just go to our search function online and, and type in corrosion handbook, I think it would it would come up. Yeah, we'll uh, put that into the links. Uh, basically, a link to the article and that corrosion handbook. I didn't know about that. That sound that sounds pretty interesting. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll give that a read as well. So we'll we'll make sure the listeners get links for those as well. Be good bedtime reading for you. <laughs> yeah. it'll, it'll, put you it'll put you right to sleep. I guarantee you. <laughs> Two functions: learn and go to sleep. <laughs> well, don't they say like what you read right before you go to bed actually imprints itself in your brain better, so you remember it more. And you have nightmares about corrosion. <laughs> I'm corroding I think away. a lot of engineers have nightmares about corrosion, actually. Yeah, when they go in the ocean, their hair is corroding and all that stuff. Yeah, it'll, it'll be like that. I'll have one of those dreams. Yeah, I know. I was, um, I forget what I was looking at. I think it was, I would, it was when I was in Houston and I was like driving under a bridge. And at the time I was working with a contractor and he was like, yeah, just, just look under the bridges. He was like, you'll see these marks. And I was like, okay. And he was like, that's the corrosion of the rebar. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That's and then I problem. started noticing it everywhere. And I was like, you know what? We're not going under any bridges anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Old concrete bridges over water. Yeah. Yes. It's like when crazy. rebar rusts, it, it really rusts and just falls everything out. But without getting too much into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, well, Chris, hopefully well, some of this money that's that's been allocated will, will be used to, to fix some of that. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, I'm so excited. I was glad that was released. It's it's always interesting. So when I before I worked with uh, before I worked with Hilti, I remember working in the office and um, one my supervisor at the time worked with ASCE. And she would always like pull out the yearly report card and she was like, well, we have a D in bridges. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's, yeah. that's close to failing. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of that has to do with corrosion. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Chris, thanks so much for answering all of our questions and providing us those links and resources. Uh, we'll definitely, like I said, we'll provide those resources to uh, links down below and uh, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, it's a it's a long, complicated uh, topic. And as you mentioned, you really can't expect a structural engineer to also be a, a corrosion expert or a metallurgist. But uh, it's, at least uh, I hope people will sort of pay attention more, a little bit more attention to it. And then, you know, if they do have a concern, you know seek out the appropriate resources and make sure that they're calling out for the, for the right thing. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or any questions you may have. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you will find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 69, as well as any links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during the episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all your structural engineering endeavors.